Cole saw a movement and shoved the last half of his security detail out of the way and grabbed the shell of a computer off the shelf. He wanted to check and make sure he hadn't shoved the kid too hard, forgetting that they didn't weigh much. Cole wasn't able to though, because in that same moment, a guy with a nail gun turned the corner and with a flash of light unleashed a volley of nails directly where Cole would have been unprotected a second sooner. Carpenter nails pounded into the oversized computer server case two and three per second at upper subsonic speeds. Cole could hear them entering and being contained inside, but it wouldn't last long. As holes turned to tears through one end, the nails were picking up speed into the metal and the circuits inches away from Cole's body. Cole was pinned and couldn't see forward. If he advanced, there would be more vulnerable surface area for the assailant to aim towards. Cole's hands were each protected within the metal he had, but felt the nails creep up as the rate of fire didn't decrease. Normally, Cole would have made some kind of joke about the nail gun being fully semi-automatic, but the idea of being perforated by about 50 nails took the humor out of it. The guy seemed like he wasn't going to go for Cole's legs unless he moved forward. Cole was angled in a way to where his right leg was protecting his sensitive main blood pathways throughout his legs, but he knew the nails in his thigh would hurt badly and immobilize him. While the giant computer case protected his upper half, the assailant was aiming for Cole's head to try to take him out of the fight entirely. It made sense at this distance, but it wasn't any information that would help Cole. Cole was frustrated, but in moments it wouldn't matter. Trying to count the nails was nearly impossible, but Cole estimated still about 50 left. More than enough to put Cole out of commission and likely bleed to death in horrible, agonizing pain. Not the idea that Cole had in mind, but there wasn't any choice. Then, right as it seemed like the nails were going to punch through and cause Cole substantially more pain than he'd had only moments before got patched up for, the light reflected by his head. He tried in a heartbeat to figure out where it was coming from. It was reflecting in front of him, which meant it wasn't aimed at him. Whispers of nails flowed from behind Cole on the ground. His security had finally joined the fight and aimed the nail stream at the legs of the bad guy. He yelled as he streamed nails down the shelved corridor precariously close to his downed friend. The flashlight had illuminated that he was crumpled in the corner, stirring, likely due to having heard his name. Cole, go! The nails hadn't found purchase yet into the bad guy as they were hardly accurate enough to hit legs at this distance with any consistency. The guy didn't know that, though, and started to aim down at the security guard. Unable to decide which course of action was best and likely feeling invincible. The split second Cole felt the nails stopping their assault on his computer. He ran at the nail commando at full speed. The distance was covered in seconds due to Cole's stride as he ran at an angle inches away from the angle the security guard was shooting at. The bad guy was inches away from hitting the downed guard. The guard screamed as they both missed by inches due to their range accuracy and blinding each other with the nail gun's flashlights. That gave Cole the perfect sight picture and he ran like a linebacker, hitting a door at full speed, thinking it's sturdy. What really happened was more like running through those kind of flappy doors to go into the back of a kitchen, because the 40 pound CPU case added even more weight to Cole and the guy was crushed against a concrete wall as if he'd been hit with a fully loaded freight truck. Cole bounced back from unexpected rigidity and squishiness of all the different materials colliding at the same time and toppled over. Chapter 4 When Worlds Collide Cole got up as fast as he can could and looked over at the two guards. Dole was coming around and had several bruises and cuts. His friend hobbled over, the nails having missed anything major, but still having cut him up from ricochet, shrapnel, and close calls. Dole called out first to his friend Murph, and they both checked on each other. Neither bothered to worry about Cole anymore as someone came with a smaller medical kit and patched them both up. Someone shined a flashlight in Dole's eyes and checked for a concussion and started patching him up. 
A boy and girl rounded the corner and thanked them. They both spoke pretty much at the same time, huddled in their blanket with hands on each other. He was a spy, some kind of infiltrator. We found him talking on a radio in a foreign language. We recognized a few of the words. When we asked him what was going on, he slapped her. The boy pointed to the girl. Said she was a dirty whore in his language, which pissed me off. But when I tried to get up, I was weak. She held him. He had a few bruises on his face, and they both started quietly crying. Cole spoke. You weren't weak. You're just hungry. You did the right thing. They both nodded, feeling a little better. The medical kid took a look at them as well. More people started clambering up from their blankets and mattresses to check out the commotion. Now that it was safe. Some of the youngest kids started picking up the nails with little magnets, carefully to keep them away from the computers. More people came thinking Cole had did this, and they all looked pretty mad, though Cole was sure they couldn't do much in their weakened state. He looked at Murph and tried to apologize. Murph wasn't having any of it. You saved me. You saved Dole. They all three looked at the unrecognizable crushed body, remembering him suddenly. Dole shooed everyone away as Murph checked the body. A radio chirped on and began to chatter. That looked to have been stolen from the electronics area, which is why their multiple searches never caught it. Murph and Cole looked at each other, and Cole picked up the radio and positioned it so they could listen. It was lots of blah blah blah, but from what Cole understood, it sounded like they were coordinating attack that was supposed to commence soon. Cole looked at Murph with urgency. We need to go talk to your leader now about this, emphasizing the radio. Murph nodded and got Cole to the next checkpoint, which was another hard wall set of back rooms. More kids with nail guns greeted them. Girls this time. They looked tough. They had that indignant look like nobody would ever touch them again. Cole suspected not many boys made it through this area and walked past several more girls like, looking at him suspiciously. Some of them sharpening motherboards and ethernet cards into spearheads and ninja stars and all various forms of throwing varieties. Cole wanted to stop and look but was still trying to avoid getting nailed by anyone here. Finally, after walking through several rooms, they got to management looking offices and the girls stopped at a specific upper management looking door and motioned them in. The door opened and inside was Reagan. Cole face palmed and spoke slyly. I should have known. Reagan smirked. Yeah, well, what'd you expect? Cole responded as he always did. Don't really have expectations anymore, just going with what feels right. Reagan nodded. Cole saw his club and dual 1911 and a chirp followed by an unintelligible chatter came over the radio. They both started at it, stared at it and looked, neither able to particularly speak the language. It was staticky anyway and they would need to get higher to get a clear signal. Cole handed it to Reagan and she powered it off and tossed it aside with a pout. There was a tension in the air that Cole couldn't directly recognize. He saw that Reagan had a wristband also. It had been hidden under her lab coat earlier, he mused to himself. Cole held his up and looked at it, and it was blinking super fast again like he was close. She held hers up, and it was blinking super fast as well. Reagan said somewhat incredulously, Hmm, interesting. It's never done that before. Cole nodded. Mine blinks when I'm near important stuff. It's what led me here. I figure it's to open things, but it's blinking fast and nothing's opening. Reagan seemed to think for a second and held her wristband, which looked more feminine like a bracelet a girl would wear, and waggled it at Cole's. He lifted his arm up and waggled his arm back at her in a mock salute. They must have stayed close long enough and sent some kind of signal to each other because all of a sudden both wristbands changed colors. His had been blue and hers had been radiating black. They both changed to purple. Reagan said, wow, purple. I might not mind showing it off now. I was afraid of the black. People would think I was a vampire or something. They both chuckled and they remembered why they were there. Reagan realized at the same time also that time was ticking. She slid him a box of 45 ACP and he picked up his dual 1911, popped out the mags and started reloading. 
didn't hold a lot of rounds, but he didn't plan on getting into any serious gun battles anyway. His only goal was to get in and out, and his aim with a firearm, not so great. Not having a lot of opportunities to train in such a strict state with any firearm over a few rounds in it anyway. <laughs>